it is a blessing to see so many faces here in the congregation today as well, um, as we again are able to accommodate more in-person worshipers. But I also want to uh, extend a greeting to those who continue to join us via live stream. I hope you are blessed and that you feel very much a part of this worship service today, that you are indeed part of our church family. Wherever you're watching from today, you are part of this church, and we are grateful for you. Would you join me in prayer, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Recently, my family uh, had an interesting visitor. We continue to have this visitor. It's a male Oriole. He spends a lot of time on my daughter Wren's car, which seems perfectly ironic and wonderful that he would choose that car, especially with her name. But he also spends some time on mine as well, because what he does is he's, he sits, especially in the front of the car, staring at the windshield because he sees his reflection there, and he thinks he's facing a rival. That's why we're pretty sure he's a male Oriole, because Kristen, my wife, did some reading about that and found out that this is a typical behavior of certain male birds in the spring. They believe their reflections in glass windows to be other birds of the same species who might get in the way as they try to impress the females. So they stand, they stake out their territories and they stand up to the competition. Kristen has named our Oriole Don Quixote because he's tilting at windmills. He's a tough little bird who doesn't seem to be intimidated by us at all. I mean, we can walk right up near him. Take, we've got plenty of pictures of him as well. He just hops around on the cars, especially, as I said, in the front there, staring down his imaginary rival and, of course, leaving lots of evidence of his presence on the dark car paint. <laughs> Don Quixote the bird like the fictional character in Cervantes' classic novel, sees and believes in something existing only in the mind and acts accordingly. That's just the opposite of what the followers of Jesus did after the report of his resurrection from the dead reached them that first Easter Sunday. They saw something that was fact, the empty tomb, but didn't really believe or act as though they did. John's Gospel says that Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb where Jesus had been buried and found the stone rolled away. She then ran to Simon Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we presume to be John, the author of the Gospel, and told them that Jesus' body had been taken. These two disciples then ran to the tomb and confirmed that Jesus' body was gone. And after the men went home, Mary stood weeping at the empty tomb. But before long, she encountered the risen Christ. And after Jesus spoke with her, she reported this wonderful news to the disciples. And that takes us up to today's scripture in the Gospel of John. Now, you'd think that the disciples, with this amazing news, would be doing high fives. But John says that they were behind locked doors that evening afraid of the Jews, likely the Jewish leaders. Evidently, they feared being arrested as Jesus had been, even though there's nothing that suggests that the, that the Jewish religious authorities cared about them at all. They really wanted their leader, Jesus, whom they thought they had taken care of with the cross. Nevertheless, the followers of Jesus were scared, and then, despite Mary's amazing report, were cowering behind locked doors. Today's scripture tells us something about the disciples, doesn't it? And in particular, Thomas, but it really tells us a lot more about Jesus. I'm afraid we so often fixate on the so-called so doubting Thomas and miss the remarkable contrasting image of Jesus emerging from this story. The locked doors really frame that picture, pun intended. And I apologize for it. <laughs> The, the disciples hide in fear behind the locked doors. They, they've just learned that Jesus is alive and, and that he was seen outside the tomb. So do they go looking for him? No. They're too scared and they stay inside. Jesus, on the other hand, comes to them. This is a really important point. Jesus comes to them. The locked doors, whether the up, of the upper room or of the heart and mind of the disciples, can't keep Jesus away. 
The same is true of our locked doors. They won't keep Jesus away either. We may try to shut our hearts and minds to Christ, either intentionally or inadvertently by focusing elsewhere. But Jesus' love for us is never blocked by our locked doors. As Paul writes in Romans, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Bishop Will Williman tells the story of when he visited a man who was only days from dying. In Williman's words, I asked him there at the end what he was feeling. Was he fearful? Fear? No, he responded. I'm not fearful because of my faith in Jesus. We all have hope that our future is in God's hands, I said somewhat piously. This is Williman's writing now. Well, I'm not hopeful because of what I believe about the future, the man corrected him. I'm hopeful because of what I experienced in the past. Williman says that he asked him to say more. And here's what the man said. I look back over my life, all the mistakes I've made, all the times I've turned away from Jesus, gone my own way, strayed, and gotten lost. And time and again, he came back for me. He found a way to get to me, showed up and got me, looked for me when I wasn't looking for him. I don't think he'll let something like my dying get in the way of his love for me. To which I would add, amen. Thomas, of course, wasn't present with the other disciples when Jesus made his first surprise visit to them. I can almost imagine his saying something like, sure, Jesus is alive and mysteriously appeared among you in spite of the locked doors when they told him about his appearance. Actually, he did say very graphically that unless he saw and touched the wounds Jesus suffered on the cross, he wouldn't believe. He needed empirical evidence, not just hearsay. A week later, just as we're a week past Easter Sunday, same time frame, the disciples are back together behind closed doors. And that's an interesting thing. The NRSV says closed, the NIV says locked doors again. And this time Thomas is with them. Once again, Jesus appears among them. So what does Jesus do? He does not wait for Thomas to reach out for, to him, but instead invites Thomas to touch and see his wounds. Now here we see clearly that Jesus will always reach out to us rather than wait for us to seek him first. Jesus meets us where we are, wherever we are, giving us what we need for faith in him. Jesus doesn't let locked doors of fear or doubt keep him away. He doesn't chastise the disciples for being afraid. I mean, think about this. They themselves saw Jesus on Easter Sunday. A week later, they're now behind locked doors again, or at least closed doors. They're not out there celebrating. They're stuck inside. Jesus doesn't chastise them when he suddenly shows up again, and Jesus doesn't chastise Thomas for doubting. He doesn't chastise them for fear. He doesn't chastise them for not believing. And while Jesus does not force us to believe and accept his free gift of grace, Jesus is nevertheless relentless in reaching out to us. He never gives up on us. Never. We can't lock out his love. It's important to notice in today's scripture that Jesus doesn't just appear to the disciples showing them that he's alive. He also speaks to them, telling them how they too would be alive in their faith after speaking a word of peace to them, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now, we may overlook the significance of this statement by Jesus, but what he's doing here is changing the status of his closest followers. They have been his disciples, meaning his followers or students. They've been learning under his tutelage. But now he's changing, expanding, if you will, their role in God's kingdom. When Jesus says he's sending them as the Father has sent him, he is making them apostles, which means those who are sent. 
They're being sent on the mission of God to the world. They've had three years of following the master's lead and learning from his teachings and example. Now they're being changed from mere followers of Christ into those who are called to go out and carry to all the world the good news that Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, is alive and has taken away the sins of the world. They are sent. They are apostles. According to John, when Jesus speaks these words and transforms his disciples into apostles, he also breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. And thus, they are empowered to fulfill their new role. Similarly, uh, similar to how God spoke creation into existence in Genesis chapter 1 and then breathed life into Adam in Genesis 2, Jesus here speaks a new form of Christian into existence, the apostle. And he breathes life into him with the power of the Holy Spirit. But does this new calling apply only to the first disciples? Are they the only apostles? I mean, we typically refer to the the inner circle of 12 as the apostles with a capital A. But did Jesus intend to send only them on the mission of God? I don't think so. I believe that they were the first but not the last apostles. Every disciple of every generation is ultimately called to be an apostle sent out into the world beyond the locked doors. As commentator Gail O'Day writes, to celebrate the resurrection, the fourth gospel suggests, is also to celebrate the beginnings of the church's mission in the world. Jesus lives not because he can walk through locked doors and show his wounds to frighten disciples, but because he breathes new life into those disciples through the gift of the Spirit and commissions them to continue his work. I believe this applies to you and me as well and to all servants of Christ. It's part of the baptism covenant that we all took today. Andrew and Carrie on behalf of Lily, but all of us were part of that. We all recommissioned or were recommissioned. We all promised again to be led by God into this great mission. I believe Jesus calls us to swing open the locked doors and to go out into the world. We're not to be of the world, but in the world, bearing the message of good news found in Jesus Christ, offering hope where often there is none, seeking justice where it's denied, giving love to the quote-unquote unlovable. You and I are sent by Jesus. We are apostles. Now, we have a lot in common with the original apostles, however, when it comes to their reluctance at first to live into their calling of being sent, of throwing open the locked doors. I know I do. It's often easier to stay in here behind locked doors, or at least behind closed doors, it's less risky. It's more orderly, cleaner, safer. Things are simpler in here. They seem to make more sense than the stuff out there. But that's not what Jesus calls us to, is it? He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. We're sent. We're sent out there. We're sent by Jesus to do as he did in seeking to save the lost. We're sent to make the world a better place than it is, to help the poor and the homeless and those suffering from injustice. Whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me, Jesus says. Even though we are like the first apostles and how we sometimes cower behind locked doors, however, we can rejoice that just as he did for them, Jesus does for us, coming to us behind those locked doors. Jesus seeks us even when we fail to seek him. Gail O'Day observes, Jesus gives himself to us, as he literally did to Thomas, as he did on the cross for the whole world. That self-giving by Jesus, rather than Thomas's touching his wounds. It's not even clear from the text whether Thomas actually ever did, although he was offered that by Jesus. It's that self-giving by Jesus is what caused Thomas to find his faith and boldly proclaim, my Lord 
and my God. You see, Jesus gave Thomas what he needed in that moment. And Jesus gives to each of us what we need if we only look and listen. May our encounter with the risen Christ produce such faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.